Can you think of someone in your circle of friends who has made a life-changing impact on you? Someone who shared the wisdom and encouragement that allowed you to become more than you thought you could? I'm Roger Marsh, and our guest today here on Family Talk was that honorable role model all her life. I'm joined again, of course, by our host, Dr. James Dobson. And Doctor, share with our listeners the impact of our guest on today's program, the late Mary Crowley. Well, Mary Crowley was such a godly woman, a great friend to Shirley and me, and a friend to millions, literally. She went home to be with the Lord, uh, died of cancer, but had a testimony on her lips to the last hour. Uh, I know that our listeners will find her words uh, very inspiring. We heard the first half of her message last time, as you indicated. We're going to hear the balance of it today, and it's one of those programs where I wish our listeners would write uh, our call and obtain a CD of this presentation because there are many women out there that need that counsel need that role modeling. Um, Mary uh, reminds me very much of uh, what the Apostle Paul wrote about in Titus 2, uh, which um, advises the mature women uh, to take time to mentor and train and encourage younger women. Um, She also reminds me of uh, the woman in Proverbs 31, where King Solomon uh, talked about his mother as being this godly and wise woman. That is the kind of woman Mary Crowley was, and I know that from personal experience. Well, I never had the privilege to meet her in person, but just from hearing her speak, I can tell she was truly an inspiring woman. Today here on the broadcast, we're going to hear the balance of a message that Mary Crowley gave in California many, many years ago. When we stopped last time, Mary was telling the story of Deborah found in the book of Judges. Let me take a moment and remind you of this account. Now, if you'll recall, Israel was being ruthlessly ruled by a Canaanite king. During this period, Barak was Israel's judge, and Deborah, the prophetess, went to speak with him. Now, Barak had been told by the Lord to go to battle against the Canaanites, but he told Deborah he would only go to battle if she would go with him. In other words, if she wouldn't go, he would not do as the Lord told him to do. So Deborah's response to Barak is where we're going to pick up Mary's story on the special edition of Family Talk. So as she listened to him and she said to him, hasn't God told you to do it? And he said, I'll go if you go with me. So she said, all right, I'll go with you, but only on one condition, that you not take credit for the battle. (laughs) (laughs) Things haven't changed much, have they? (laughs) So sure enough, he was getting discouraged because it tells us over there that iron had been invented and that Sisera had 900 chariots of iron. Well, there wasn't a chariot of iron one in all of Israel. So he was discouraged and dragging his feet. So one day she came to him and she said, Up, up, for this is the day. Hath not the Lord God gone out before you? And I'd say to you, Up, this is the day. This is the day for you to really be that power of strength, for you to reach up and to say, Dear Lord God, give me the strength to be the woman you want me to be in my family, in my business, in my community, wherever I am. Yes, up, for this is the day. For hath not the Lord God gone out before you. So they marched, and sure enough, after the victory, they sang a paean of praise, and the story ends with these words, the land had rest and peace for 40 years because of one woman. So I said, Lord, if you could do that with Deborah, I just wonder what you could do with Mary Crowley. I just signed up to give him a chance. (laughs) Now I'll tell you, friends, when you sign up to work with the Lord, the pay is good. Retirement's out of this world. (laughs) He never lets me down, but he never lets me off either. He keeps me everlastingly at it. There'll be times when you're weary, times when you're tired, times when you think, why do you bring me these people with these problems? And then you remember that you told him that you wanted to become what he wanted you to be. And this is part of the becoming. I have a, a little poem that I dearly love that I have to remind myself all the time of. 
Sometimes this will come to your heart and it will mean something to you. It was written by Grace Noel uh, Crowell, Grace Noel Crowell. And when I first put it in a book, I didn't know who the author was. And so it said, author unknown. Then I got a letter from a dear precious man who was her son. She was deceased. And he told me that his mother had been the author. And that it was entitled, For One Who Is Tired. You listen to the words. Dear child, God does not say to you today, Be strong. He knows your strength is spent. He knows how long the road has been, how weary you've become. For he who walked this earthly land alone, each boggy lowland and each rugged hill, understands. And so he simply says, Be still. Be still and know that I am God. The hour is late and you must rest a while. Hold up your cup, dear child, for God to fill as slow rain fills an empty cup. All he says of us is be still and know that I am God. I'm so glad that I don't have to be strong. He is strong. I don't have to be good. I want to try to be my best, but I'll never be perfect. He is good. I don't have to be a specimen in his museum of perfection. He just wants me to build a relationship with him that will somehow draw the people to love him more. And so Deborah was my model from the old. Then later when we started this business and planning for this business, I found the story again of Lydia. Lydia was a professional saleswoman. She was a seller of fine goods. She was a seller of purple. She was successful. She was hospitable. She was gracious. Paul and his little team came to the continent of Europe, and so they inquired around as to where they could find a place to worship. Somebody said, well, there's a bunch of women praying down by the riverside. So Paul went down there and joined them, and he revealed to her the Lord Jesus Christ. And that day, she and her whole family became Christians, the first convert on the continent of Europe. And so I thought, she was successful, she was hospitable, she was a seller of beautiful goods. So she became my model for our business. And as I said, our purpose was to honor God and to bless and to serve others. The business grew, and we were very successful, and the family grew, and along came grandchildren, and now the grandchildren are in the business. But during the years, many crises, of course, you do not live without crisis. And seven years ago, my son and his family, that same son, and his family had been on a ski trip, and they were coming back, and he was the pilot of the plane, and they were all in the plane. And they crash-landed short of the runway in Dallas, Texas, in a foggy, foggy night. And that particular evening, as I stood by his bedside, and he, his face was mashed in, and his ankles were messed up, and only the rest of the family was in pretty good shape, and that's only become the Mishibishi airplanes pretty sturdy. But anyway, that night, and the doctors had told us that there was a possibility that they would have to bore a hole in his brain and drain the fluid out, and it was very, very serious. But they let me stay in the ICU with him that night, and I'll never forget it. And as I was standing there by his bed, and he looked so hurt and so damaged with the trek in his throat and his face all completely mashed in, and one eye down here, and a lot of difficult things. And they had set his leg, and. I was praying over him there. By the way, pray over people even when they're unconscious. Something in their subconscious hears you. And I was talking to him and talking to the Lord. And there he lay, my big, strong business partner and big, strong son. But right then, he was just very, very hurt and my son. And it was like God said to me, Mary, I understand. I saw my son broken, hurt, lifeless, hanging on the cross. I understand. I am with you. I will be with you.
and I had a sense of his presence that I can't describe to you. Somehow, in the deepest of problems, we become much more aware of his presence. I guess it's because we take our minds off of ourselves more and we're more open to receiving him. But he did recover and he did fly again and the business and the family and life went on. But a verse that I claimed that night that I want to share with you, which I dearly love, Jeremiah 33, 3, Call unto me, and I will show you great and wonderful things which you know not. You know, we live in the day when we seek to know everything. Ah, oh, knowledge is almost king. And we have people who go to school and they get this degree and then that degree and then they've got to have other degrees. And knowledge is king and intellectualism and materialism are riding mankind. And we think we have to know so much. I've learned that as women we need to be more than to know. And so those words came to me, call unto me and I will show you great and wonderful things which you know not. Are there things that you don't know? Are there situations you don't know what to do in? Are there things you can't quite comprehend? I'm sure that there are many in a crowd this size. But God says, call unto me and I will show you great and wonderful things which you know not. Isn't that wonderful to know? God is real. He is, I often say, you know, I uh, can call my boss anytime, person to person, collect. He's always in, and he always listens. And at night I turn my worries over to him because he's going to be up all night anyway. <laughs> As women, you know, we are great warriors, right? Verses that have been a pattern for my life, Psalms 37, 1 through 5. They're probably unfamiliar to a lot of you. I'll just give them to you quickly. Fret not. <laughs> are you good at fretting? Most women are very good at fretting. We can sail through a crisis pretty well, but we fret and we fret. But this says fret not because of evildoers. In other words, don't fret about somebody else. It's so easy to fret over somebody else's sin, somebody else's wrongdoing. And it's not easy to keep from letting somebody else's wrongdoing, somebody else's ungratitude, somebody else's faithlessness, somebody else's wrongs rob us of our peace. It is not easy. It takes the grace of God. So we have to listen to him and learn from him. And we have to be committed. Wilbur Reese wrote with a little bit of sarcasm, and I think this is true of so many in our day and time. I'd like to buy three dollars worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my peace. Just enough to feel good, like a cup of warm milk or an hour in the sunshine. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want the warmth of the womb, not the new birth. I'd like about a pound of the eternal in a paper bag, three dollars worth of God, please. Let me tell you that if that's all you want, that's all you'll get. But if you want more, God is real and ready and able to make you become what he wants you to be. He can cleanse us. He can forgive us. How many times we need forgiving? Oh, we need forgiveness. There was a movie star in Hollywood who had recently become a Christian. And, of course, the rumor had gotten around, had been noised around the noon. He got on the elevator with a bunch of other people. And so some of them said to him, Well, I understand that you're now a Christian. How does it feel? You see, the world always wants to know how things feel. <laughs> it's not a feeling, it's a fact. 
Sometimes it feels, sometimes it doesn't. But he, they said, how does it feel? But he threw his arms out and he said, forgiven. Forgiven. Jesus Christ forgives, releases us, makes us free. And that is really what we all want, isn't it? I was autographing books, the pocket full of hope, and there was uh, a line of people standing there. And there was a woman who was mm, all vogue on the outside and vague on the inside. <laughs> and as she, as she got up to the table there, she said, uh, make that to a friend of mine. She's into that. I said, oh, into what? Oh, into religion. Isn't that a book about religion? And I looked her straight in the eye and I said, no. It's a book about a relationship with the living God. Tears immediately came down her beautiful cheeks and she said, make it to me. I don't have that. There's so many people who don't have that. Do you have that? Oh, today, sweet friend, I flew from Dallas here yesterday. I fly back this afternoon, and I came with but one message and for one purpose, that you might know the living God and have a relationship with him and might know how much he loves you, cares for you, yearns over you. If there's righteousness in the heart, there'll be beauty in the character. If there's beauty in the character, there'll be harmony in the home. If there's harmony in the home, there'll be order in the nation. If there's order in the nation, there'll be peace in the world. It starts in the home. I heard a wonderful statesman from Israel say one time, no nation, no culture, no society rises any higher than the standards of its women. And so, I think it's so vital that we get the standards up. Look around you, women have let the standards down. And you see it in television, in the media, in literature, in behavior. The standards have been let down. God help us and forgive us and help us to once again raise those standards up. I have on my arm a diamond watch. It was given to me by my friend Ethel Waters. Julie DeCord is here today and she helped take care of Ethel when she uh, was ill and so she'll know very much of what I'm talking about. I had become friends with Ethel Waters in 1971 and so we had sort of adopted one another because she didn't have a daughter and I didn't have a mother and there was something special about her that endeared us to one another. And so one day she was worrying about if her money didn't last as long as she did. And I just reassured her that I would help take care of her when she got old because she could be my mom. So in 1976, she called me to her room. We were in San Diego. And she said, I've got something for you. And she hands me this watch. She said, those are real diamonds. <laughs> I bought them in my heyday. <laughs> and I said, oh, I can't possibly take that. Yes, you can. One of these days I'm going where I don't need any more clocks. And sure enough, a year later, she did. And I went to the memorial service at Forest Lawn. Wires came from heads of state around the world for this woman. Because so you see, it tells me two things I have other watches, but this one is special because it tells me she was my friend. I loved her and she loved me. But something else that's so very important, and that is that it again reminds me that to God there's no such thing as an unwanted child. She was born to a 13-year-old girl, victim of rape in the slums outside of Philadelphia. By the standards of Today, she'd be aborted. But you see, somewhere along the line, God touched her life. 
She became a role model, not only for her race, but for a lot of us. In her early years, she introduced the St. Louis Blues. In her mature years, she introduced his eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. And so it everlastingly reminds me that every person is somebody, every person a possibility for redemption, every person a potential for greatness, and this keeps me ever reminding myself that every person has human dignity and we must not injure it. Yes, be somebody. God doesn't take time to make a nobody. But he wants to help you become the somebody you can be. He loves us just as we are. But he loves us too much to leave us that way. And the only way we can ever truly love other people as they are is to accept his love for us as we are. That's my message to you. That's what has sustained me through these many years, yes, of success and of failure, of joy and of pain, of hurt and of gladness. And he will sustain you. I highly recommend my friend. Jesus Christ. As Jody wrote on my little adorable note in my room with a basket of fruit, she was talking about today, and she said, oh, we want it all to be to the glory of Jesus Christ. It's his party. And so today is his party. I hope he is your friend. If not, please don't go away without knowing that Jesus Christ loves you and he is your friend. Thank you, Shirley, for letting me come and share with your beautiful ladies. This is a glorious day and a wonderful opportunity. Well, that voice was of the late Mary Crowley on the special edition of Family Talk giving us a wonderful reminder of the hope of Jesus and the gospel message. And doctor, I want to point out too that the Shirley that she's referring to in the end is your beloved wife. Well, as you said uh, at the top of the program, uh, this message was given at the Arcadia Christian Celebrity Series, and Shirley was one of the organizers of that group. And in fact, she invited Mary to be there. Mary Crowley was such a wonderful friend to Shirley and me, and uh, we have missed her dearly since she went to be with the Lord. Um, I think I mentioned this last time, but it bears repeating, that Mary was dying of cancer at the Baylor Medical Center, and uh, there she was in the last days of her life, and she was talking about Jesus all the time, and there was sunshine on her face and in her voice. And uh, a nurse who was there wrote me a note about those last days uh, to describe what Mary was like as she was preparing to go to be with the Lord. And this is what she wrote. Mary Crowley was always encouraging, even when she was very weak and ill. She was a fountain of scripture memory verses, and she often shared them with me for one reason or another. She had inspirational music playing on a recorder in her room, and it was both for her enjoyment and comfort, but also as a means of sharing Christ with the hospital staff. Um, she went on to describe uh, those last days and said that even after Mary died, uh, the staff continued to refer to that place as Mary Crowley's room. She made quite an impact on everyone who knew her, and I hope this message today has been an encouragement to especially the women out there who uh, have been down. They've been carrying a heavy load, and they've been saying, Lord, uh, would you help me at this time? I really need a touch from you. Mary Crowley is that answer. Yes, it is certainly clear how much she loved the Lord and that wisdom showed in everything she did. Well, this wraps up another edition of Family Talk. I'm Roger Marsh, and on behalf of Dr. James Dobson, thank you so much for sharing a part of your day with us. Hope you'll join us again next time for another edition of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk.
This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Tim Glinton with the James Dobson Family Institute. You want a quick and easy way to listen to family talk? Well, hey, we're excited to tell you how you can catch our daily broadcast on Amazon Alexa. That's right, Amazon Alexa. This hands-free smart device allows you to hear myself and Dr. Dobson while you go around your daily routine. Once you enable the family talk skill, say... Alexa, play today's broadcast of Family Talk. It's as effortless as that. Learn how you can set up Family Talk on your Amazon Alexa by visiting drjamesdobson.org forward slash Alexa. That's drjamesdobson.org forward slash Alexa.